Wow, what a, what a turnout. Thank you all for uh, coming out this morning to see uh, uh, Professor Jason Castillo from Texas A&M. Um, just a few words about Jason's background before we get started. Uh, he is the Associate Professor, professor and the Evelyn and Ed F. Cruz, 49 Faculty Fellow at Texas A&M University. They're the owner of the Bluebell Ice Cream. <laughs> Um, at the George Bush School of Government and Public Service. Jason uh, came to the Bush School after serving on the staff of Policy Planning Office in the Department of Defense between 2005 and 2007. And before that, he worked at RAND Corporation and at the Institute for Defense Analysis, IDA. His PhD is in political science from the University of Chicago. And his research focuses on U.S. national security policy, especially nuclear deterrence. Um, how many here have had uh, Jason's uh, deterrence and coercion course? Okay. So we have quite a few of uh, uh, Jason's alums from uh, that course. I am also, by the way. And uh, so we've had the pleasure, uh, those of us who have been in the course, have had the pleasure of uh, working with Jason, having him present uh, do, uh, his uh, views on deterrence and coercion at the Bush School as part of this laboratory's partnership with Texas A&M University, uh, and it's part of what we call the National Security Leadership Program. And it is something that is continuing on. For those of you that haven't uh, been involved, it's certainly something you should think about doing if you have the opportunity. For me personally, it helped prepare me for my time in Washington, D.C., and then now, as I'm back here in my systems analysis group, uh, I, I apply a lot of the things that I've learned from Jason uh, to ongoing work that we're doing now for the laboratory. So with that, please uh, join me in welcoming Jason. Is it safe for a Dodger fan to enter this room? <laughs> <laughs> that was early for that argument to come out. Uh, <clears throat> does anyone remember um, uh, when Reagan was running against Mondale, uh, there was a famous commercial about uh, a bear in the woods, right? There's a bear in the woods. You can, you can you look at this in the YouTube machine. I do this late at night when I have trouble sleeping. Uh, but the whole message was like there was a debate about the intentions of the Soviet Union, whether we... Soviet Union was being encircled, or whether or not the Soviet Union was hell-bent on world domination. Uh, that debate went away in 1989, right, thanks to our namesake at, uh, at the Bush School. Uh, but uh, it appears now the bear is back, right? And if you look at the nuclear posture review, uh, the big driver there is not China, it's not North Korea, it's not Iran, it's really Russia. Right? It's the extended deterrence mission that we uh, have vis-a-vis -vis NATO, with respect to NATO, and the growing Russian military modernization and, and changing Russian intentions that's driving the nuclear posture of you. Uh, and I know this, in this group, you've all memorized and probably can chant the nuclear posture of you by now in its original Latin. But uh, one of the striking things about the nuclear posture of you is that uh, all the critics who are sort of surprised and uh, that we believe in limited nuclear war, that the idea that the United States has thought about limited nuclear war is, oh my God, this is you know, another, uh, another nail in the Trump cross, right? That he's brought back limited nuclear war. Well, I think limited nuclear war has never gone away, right? We were big practitioners and we developed concepts of limited nuclear war. And so I'm not sure we should be shocked or surprised that it's back in the nuclear posture review or that our adversaries think about limited nuclear war. And so today what I want to lay out is a framework for thinking about Russian nuclear strategy. Countries are purposely opaque about their nuclear strategies because that has deterrence value. You don't want to provide a menu and a list of actions you're going to do in certain circumstances because that will invite what Tom Schelling called salami tactics. So there is ambiguity about a country's nuclear strategy. So what we need then are some set of frameworks or some way to evaluate a country that's purposely opaque about its nuclear strategy and to think about, well, what are the circumstances under which they would use nuclear weapons? Now, 
in this group, uh, you'll know that there is a debate about Russian nuclear strategy. And the phrase that captures their strategy is escalate to de-escalate, right? And, and for some people, this is a uniquely Russian thing, right? That has to do with hybrid warfare and uh, the history of Russian occupation going back to Napoleon. You can find all these different arguments. Well, escalate to de-escalate was NATO's strategy, right? This is a strategy that states adopt when they have conventional weakness and they use nuclear weapons to offset that conventional weakness. And so what I want to do in this talk is think about what escalate to de-escalate might look like. Uh, Brad Roberts calls this Red's theory of victory in his book, his excellent book on the case for nuclear weapons. Well, let's flesh out what Red's theory of victory might look like not just for Russia, but other types of adversaries with nuclear weapons. There is not a one-size-fits-all based on strategic circumstances and capabilities. And let's try to understand the conditions under which Russia would use nuclear weapons. I think one of the themes of, of this talk and more emerging work on Russian nuclear strategy is that nuclear weapons are in the background for Russia. right? This is not the Russia of Boris Yeltsin. This is not even the Russia of 2008. This is a Russia that has developed some formidable conventional capabilities. Now, I'm not here to tell you they're the Soviet Union. They're not, the Third Shock Army is not gonna crash into West Germany anytime soon. But it's also a Russia that has seen how the United States performed in the last 17 years in conventional wars and has focused on developing conventional capabilities to keep us away and out of their neighborhood. Can you think of any other large, great powers in Northeast Asia that have developed similar capabilities? Right? People adapt. People pay attention. No one wants Saddam Hussein treatment. And Russia has adapted, especially since 2008, in developing anti-access area denial capabilities. And this is a, a work that I've been doing with uh, my colleague, John Parikini at, at RAND. So what does it look like when we have escalate to de-escalate? What does this mean? Now, there are debates about Russian nuclear strategy. Some people will say, uh, this is all about domestic consumption, right? Putin. This is some of the arguments you see uh, people like Walter Lackey are making. Putin and Putinism right, requires a muscular form of Russian nationalism. In order for him to maintain power, he has to run slideshows and cartoon shows of different Russian nuclear capabilities that may or may not exist. Uh, this bolsters his credibility at home. So it's, this is all about domestic politics. Nothing to see here. They don't really have any kind of nuclear strategy to be worried about. Uh, I think that's probably true, but they are building their capabilities, and it looks like it's integrated with their conventional forces, so we should start thinking to be a prudent planner what that might look like. And we need some kind of framework to think about what's the strategy today and what might the strategy look like over time. So let's back up and think about the constraints that Russia faces. If you don't think the Russian nuclear strategy is just for domestic consumption, and I'm not one of those people, I think they actually have a strategy. It's not clear, so we have to puzzle it out. One constraint they face is they understand that we are really good at conventional war. Uh, CJSR put out a terrific paper on Russian nuclear strategy by uh, Dave Johnson, and he outlines how in Russian military doctrine, they're obsessed with aerospace operations. Right? So if you hit Shift F7 on your Microsoft Word, that's a synonym for US air power, <laughs> US tactical precision air power. And how do you keep, step one, how do you keep the US Air Force away? <laughs> and step two, how do you operate in this kind of environment? Right? They've seen this show. I mean, look at the empirical record of the last 17 years. Right? Saddam Hussein twice, Libya, Afghanistan, for good measure, the Chinese will probably say something about Kosovo in 1998 and precision guided munitions that hit their embassies. We're very good at conventional war, right? So the so-called middle of the, of the spectrum. So that's the first constraint. 
One way to adjust to that constraint is to develop nuclear weapons. Everyone remember uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert Work? And he talked about offsets, right? What was the first offset? He talks about different offsets. Well, the first offset was our nuclear weapons against Soviet conventional weapons. Well, they're developing offsets, right? What was the second offset? It was our precision guided munitions against Soviet conventional superiority. What do you see in Russian conventional developments? Precision guided munitions. And the third offset, which we've thought about in terms of the China-US conflict in the Straits of Taiwan, is a so-called air-sea battle, which is using attacks on command and control with precision guided munitions to overcome someone's anti-access area denial capability. But it's pre pretty clear to me that Russia is pursuing those first two offsets, right? This is straight out of the Cold War playbook, right? I'm conventionally weak vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So I'm going to use nuclear weapons to offset that. And I'm also going to imitate in the precision guided munitions developments the United States has made in all those investments to offset US aerospace power. They modernize and we're modernizing. So it's an action reaction cycle. Now some people are shocked by this, right? And I think they need to sort of take a step back and understand that history did not end in 1991, right? You all remember that Frank Fukuyama essay in the National Interest that he actually wrote, uh, I think, when he was still at RAND. Uh, and the argument was that, you know, before World War, II, World War I, sorry, before World War II, you had three competing ideologies. You had communism, national socialism, and liberalism, right? And then in the Cold War, you knock out national socialism, you have socialism and liberalism, and then liberalism wins in 1991. What does this mean? Well, we figured it out. There won't be any more great power conflicts. On top of that, we're the unipolar power, right? Remember Charles Krothheimer, who re recently passed? He coined that phrase, the unipolar moment. Well, maybe we're not in the unipolar moment. There are a lot of us who are skeptical of the idea that there would be one great power forever and ever, locking in liberal institutions, the world would keep getting better and better. The trend in great power politics is people compete. They adjust. Our adversaries are adjusting, and we're adjusting. And again, when I give this talk elsewhere, uh, people are kind of shocked that the United States had a policy during the Cold War of using nuclear weapons first. But you know, if, we, if I could teleport you back to 1983 when the music was really good and the fashion was terrific, right? Uh, and I could run a YouTube clip of General like John Galvin, head of SACU and NATO. He talked about using nuclear weapons three days into a conventional conflict with the Soviet Union. And that's a, that's a purposeful threat, which is, if you beat me conventionally, I will use nuclear weapons. So this isn't something new, like this, oh, this exotic Russian military strategy. This is sort of how great powers behave. So one thing that is clearly different, though, is the strategic circumstances different. So think of it this way. During the Cold War, right, we made it very clear to the Soviet Union that Western Europe was important to us, right? We, we uh, develop strategic nuclear weapons to defend Western Europe. We develop tactical nuclear weapons to defend Western Europe. We raised a large conventional military to defend Western Europe. We put our families in Western Europe. We put our soldiers there, but we also put our families there. That's signaling that we have skin in the game, right? My wife was born in Frankfurt. I always tell her, you were part of the US extended deterrent. Right? Because what you were signaling to the Russians is if war happens, you're going to kill Americans. And that's going to tie our hands and force us to defend and use nuclear weapons. So we, we did a lot to convince the Soviets that Western Europe mattered greatly to us. In other words, the stakes were very high for us. And that's important because if the stakes are high, we're going to take more risk to defend something that's important. 
If you think about the conflicts we might have with potentially nuclear armed adversaries elsewhere, the stakes seem to favor them. That's a very dangerous situation. So think about it this way. If you're going to have a fight with Russia in the Baltics as they're defending ethnic minorities, Russian minorities in Estonia, right? Russia is going to be conventionally weaker in the aggregate than the United States, and the stakes are going to be higher for them than the United States. That's not a recipe for stability. That's a recipe for a dangerous escalation. So I like to say the tables have turned, right? In the past, we were conventionally weak, and we threatened nuclear first use, and that looks really hard. I know some of us look fondly back to the Cold War, not only just at fashion and pop culture, <laughs> but we also have this view that it was easy, right? The Cold War was clear, there was two great powers, and everyone knew what the rules, well, actually, when you go back and look at the history, it wasn't easy at all, right? Well, you know, in 1980, we figured out how nuclear deterrence worked. We did? That's a news flash, right? If I took a poll in this audience and asked you, how does nuclear deterrence work? And I even gave you three options. We would get some kind of distribution. We, have a, we don't have a consensus about how nuclear deterrence works. And by the way, I think that explains a lot of the hand-wringing in the nuclear posture review. They haven't figured out how nuclear deterrence works either, and they don't know how the Russians think about how nuclear deterrence works. So the Cold War circumstance was hard. And I'm here to tell you that the circumstance we're in now is even harder. There's an upside and a downside to that, right? The upside is we have plenty of business, nuclear modernization. And the downside is I'm not sure I want to be in this strategic circumstance, right? Because I used to be in the circumstance where I had to credibly convince you that I would use nuclear weapons first to defend NATO. Now I'm in the circumstance of having to deter you, deter the Russians from using nuclear weapons first in a conventional conflict where they have more at stake. Think about how difficult that is, right? So if you're the US uh, and NATO during the Cold War or Russia today and you face conventional weakness and you want to make threats of nuclear first use to prevent a conventional defeat, right? you have to choose options between doing nothing and emptying out the whole arsenal between no first use and what Eisenhower would call massive retaliation, right? You have to attenuate the problem between zero and one. And so to do that, you have to think about, well, what are the different strategies that I could adopt that would make nuclear use credible? There's one more complicating factor. In the Cold War and in today, both sides have survivable retaliatory capabilities. Now we can argue about like, well, if the US struck first and the, it wasn't very cloudy that day and Putin was on vacation, we might get 99% of the arsenal. OK, but that 1% is still going to hurt. <laughs> so if your adversary can, can retaliate in kind, then you have a credibility problem threatening the first use of nuclear weapons. So how do you do that? What are the best ways to develop credible strategies? And what I'm going to take you through are different schools of thought on this question that an adversary like Russia or China or North Korea might pursue in order to prevent conventional defeat, something we thought about. And the goal here is some kind of negotiated settlement that turns off the war. In other words, this is called flexible response. Remember old flexible response? Robert McNamara, brought to you by your friends at the Rand Corporation, right? Somewhere in this ladder of escalation, I need options. Policymakers don't like the, well, we won't use nuclear weapons. It's all a giant hoax. And they don't like the, well, we'll strike first and get all the weapons. They, well, what's your second best option? So school one, popularized by people like Bob Jervis, uh, Bernard Brody, most of the academics who train me, like Charlie Glazer, uh, is the punishment school. It says that nuclear weapons are good at imposing costs. Right? They're good at pa inflicting pain. 
They're not like giant artillery shells. This is why we've had a nuclear revolution, right? You know the story about Bernard Brody. He's finishing his PhD at the University of Chicago. He's listening to Mahler. He's writing about naval strategy. And then 1945 happens. Two atomic bombs drop, right? Suddenly, <laughs> that book on naval strategy doesn't look as interesting. And, and to paraphrase uh, his views, uh, the, the nature of warfare has changed, right? Now militaries uh, think about deterring war, not winning wars, right? This is someone who thinks that there's been a revolution in military affairs. This is something we like to talk about in defense circles. Well, Brody and company would say, this is really is a revolution, right? Because now I can destroy another country in 30 minutes or less without defeating their military in the field, right? And this only and technology will aid that over time during the Cold War. And the key to making deterrence work is having a survivable nuclear force. What does survivable mean? It means you can't get it with the first strike. If I have a survivable nuclear force, then we should live in stability, right? And, and no, one's gonna, no one's gonna run the Schlieffen plan or blitzkrieg into France if I have nu a survivable nuclear force because I'll send the other side back to year zero, right, is the argument. And in a sense, we should see great stability. Nuclear weapons are a force for stability. You should embrace and love the bomb. I had that, uh, you remember the, those old Planet of the Apes movies and there's one Planet of the Apes movie where they like worship this nuclear bomb. You know, it's this, this is what I think of when I talk about the nuclear revolution. Now, of course, the problem for these folks, right, is that that's not how people behave, <laughs> right? No one in this room or uh, within defense circles during the Cold War thought that we lived in a stable environment because we arms raced, right? We arms raced in very intense qualitative and quantitative ways. At the other end of the extreme, right, you know this is Curtis LeMay, smoking irradiated ruins, <laughs> Curtis LeMay. Uh, his, his argument, and, and people in this school, is they think deterrence actually is not robust, and it's likely to fail for rational and irrational reasons. People can miscalculate, they can make mistakes. And so what you really need is the capability to destroy and disrupt the other side's nuclear forces. And if you're going to make any credible threat for deterrence, it requires counterforce, going after someone else's nuclear forces. And, uh, the problem with this is that it's, it sounds great, but it's extremely difficult, right? Uh, now, you know, we could probably go to different rooms uh, where, where I can't go in, and you know, there's secret ninjas and precision this and that and UAVs. But, Again, one argument that you should remember from the nuclear revolution folks is that one or two of these really hurt if they land on Dodger Stadium, right? So yes, you probably could limit lots of damage. There's no doubt that we have impressive precision capabilities. The question is, can you get it all without getting your hair mussed up? Uh, folks know who this is? Harold Brown, right? He used to be a former uh, head of Livermore at the age of 38, so we all feel like underachievers. Uh, I'm working my way through the uh, Pentagon's official history of Harold Brown's uh, time in the Defense Department. An amazing guy, sort of programmed all the capabilities that Reagan could later use to win the Cold War. Uh, but he's also one of the fathers of the countervailing strategy. Right. And, and Brown's argument was that we need something between relying on second strike nuclear forces like the punishment school advocate and uh, damage limitation capabilities. We need the ability to fight a limited nuclear war. Lots of questions pop into your head when you think about limited nuclear war. The first question you think about is, well, uh, how am I going to win? What does winning look like? Is there some kind of abacus where someone's keeping score? Or, uh, you know, what, at what point does someone cry uncle? And here I want to introduce the concept of escalation dominance. Like much of our liturgy on nuclear deterrence, it has been uh, abused and uh, used in ways I don't think are appropriate. 
Escalation dominance basically means I want to deter you from continuing the fight. I want to convince you that this isn't going anywhere, right? Hence, the countervailing strategies focus on denying war aims. But notice what that means. It means you have to have the ability to control escalation, right? When these things start to go off, if we believe, even if we're not full nuclear revolution people, but we believe when nuclear weapons start to go off, are people are going to be able to control their emotions. Are they going to be able to resist this? Right? How many rounds of onesies, twosies before someone says, you know, maybe Curtis has a point, right? I can't trust the Russians or the North Koreans to be restrained, right? Limited nuclear war requires restraint. It requires the ability to communicate. It requires some un mutual understanding between both sides about how what escalation dominance looks like, what winning and losing. You have to have an agreement about winning or losing looks like. Think of it as a dance. Both partners have to want to remain on the dance floor. And there will always be the temptation for this. Right? I, I think in the Cold War, we call that the clever briefer. Right? Someone who comes in and convinces you that, well, I think you're waiting too long. The more you wait doing this, right, and the more mobile missiles move. I think there's a fourth school that I want to tease out. And I'm coming to embrace this school. It's what I call the risk school. Uh, and it's personified and advocated by uh, Tom Schelling, uh, who, believes there's, who believes in a lot of the tenets of the punishment school. But you have to do things to generate risk of uncontrollable escalation in order to win in a limited nuclear conflict or even to deter, right? It's not enough to have survivable nuclear forces. You have to develop things that trigger, mechanisms that trigger the use of those nuclear forces, like tripwires, right? Schelling would say the forces we had in Germany in the Cold War, what was their purpose? Was it defense? He would say yes, right? Because that's just at the very bottom of the ladder. If I can win conventionally, that's great. Schelling would say, uh, no, the purpose of those forces is to die. Right? You, have to get, you have to think about how Schelling did his work. Schelling, was a, he approached it like an economist. Right? People are rational. They're weighing costs and benefits, expected costs, expected benefits. But he had a very simple, elegant point, which is once the shooting starts, bad things will happen. Why? Because people behave irrationally. They get afraid. They get upset. Organizations are complicated, right? There can be accidents. There could be inadvertent escalation. Uh, one of my favorite books at the end of the Cold War, and I have two hardback copies, is Barry Posen's Inadvertent Escalation. Right? It came out like in 1989, right? Sort of like Bernard Brody. You know? And Posen's point in his book is that the way the United States is preparing to fight against the Soviet Union can inadvertently trigger a nuclear war. Think about how the United States fights conventionally. Think about the old air land battle. It involved using air power, mostly air power, there's some ground, fi ground fires, but mostly air power to interdict in the rear to attack the command and control of your adversary. Why do you do that? Because well, it disrupts their ability to resist. So you rip down the air defense, go after the command and control, go after the follow-on forces, well, what's in the rear <laughs> of most nuclear armed adversaries? They're nuclear command and control. And Posen's point was the way NATO was preparing to fight could trigger inadvertent escalation. By the way, sales of that book have gone back up. It's now in reprint. <laughs> Schelling would say, well, that's actually, that's kind of good, right? Because what you want is you want people to know that once you cross that red line of the conflict, bad things are going to happen. The risk of uncontrollable escalation is going to happen. So we have now a nice distinction, right? We have one school that says limited nuclear war. Ah, who needs to worry about it? The world's a safe place. The only problem we have is convincing people that they have wrong ideas about nuclear deterrence. Right? Markets never fail until they fail. And then you have this school of thought, which is deterrence always fails. 
So we have to go after the other guy's nuclear forces with counterforce. And the good news is we can do that today with precision guided munitions. Right? We don't even have to use nuclear weapons because that's very junior varsity and we're varsity. And then you have two schools of thought about limited nuclear war. One says you've got to achieve escalation dominance. And to do that, you have to have escalation control. And then you have the flip side. It says, I see your escalation control and raise you uncontrollable escalation. Right? So, so when we talk about North Korea, we talk in these terms, especially this. Talk about escalation dominance, right? We could do a Google search and I could show you where the countervailing strategies in our DNA and RNA. But if I were advising dear leader, I would say you need to get on TV with a steering wheel and you know, maybe the Joker lipstick and right, maybe some shaving cream to say, show you're foaming at the mouth. But the point is you want to show that you're reckless and dangerous, that you're, you can't participate in a limited nuclear war that uncontrollable bad things will happen. So these are the four logics that we could tease out to think about different strategies on that ladder. So in the paper, we make some assumptions about Russia that are not true, but that's because they're assumptions. Uh, before we get into the black box, which is mired with lots of traps and dueling debates about Russian military doctrine, uh, we make some simple assumptions that Russia would want to survive. It's basically strategic. There's uncertainty, right? And we're doing this because we don't know much. And this is, remember, this is a framework that you add data to. And we argue that your strategy is driven by two variables, right? How strong are your conventional forces and how strong are your nuclear forces? Your nuclear forces tell you how ambitious your strategy can be. And your conventional forces tell you how early you have to use them in a conflict. Right? So like, I have grave doubts about the ability of North Korea to stand up to uh, South Korea and the United States in a conventional conflict. So I think they're going to use nuclear weapons early in a conflict. Right? So then you'd want to look at what does the arsenal look like, and that might tell you what limited nuclear options look like. So I think there are basically four strategies. Uh, the first two are what I call risk strategies. This is, this is embracing that Schelling-esque kind of logic. A country like China has a lot of conventional options in a fight with the United States and would use nuclear weapons, I think, late in a conflict. If I were giving this talk 10 years ago, the China mafia would come out. They'd beat me over the head and say, this is a friendly panda. It doesn't mirror image us. Uh, something about globalization. Uh, they don't think about using nuclear weapons first. But over time, you see in different reporting about China, there's been discussion about thinking about limited nuclear options. But again, it's in the background because they have some pretty impressive anti-access air denial capabilities that, that might not be able to keep us out forever in the Straits of Taiwan. But over time, the balance of power is changing in a way conventionally for them that's really good. And then there's North Korea, which I already alluded to. I think North Korea will use nuclear weapons early in a conflict. I think they would use it in a demonstrative way, right? Rattle the windows to remind people that this conflict can get out of control. The whole threat here is limited use, maybe during Wolf Blitzer's uh, situation room, a small bomb goes off or the sea of Japan is in demonstration, maybe attacks against Japan, right? The idea here is you want to make the threat that leaves something to chance, that there'll be uncontrollable escalation. Uh, Pakistan, I think, contemplates using nuclear weapons to offset India's conventional strength, hence the focus on short-range missiles that can attack advancing Indian conventional forces. And Pakistan is, what, 0 for 5, depending on how you count in conventional war with India. So this is a rational response when we thought about it. And then I think there's Russia. Russia's, these, these, this is all flexible response. I think Russia has a, a calibrated form of escalation where they will start here if necessary and then maybe use nuclear weapons to address the conventional balance. But the thing to remember about Russia is that it has an array of conventional forces that allows it to attenuate this problem even more and allows it to delay nuclear use. So I think there's a defensive logic and an offensive logic 
to how Russia will use nuclear weapons. The defensive logic at its core is, well, first, nuclear, we have nuclear weapons because we don't want to be attacked by nuclear weapons. So we will advance the survivability of our nuclear force. Then we have nuclear weapons because we don't want to be defeated by NATO in a conventional conflict. That's the defensive logic. And it depends on a form of escalation and dominance that's dependent on stakes. I want to go back to this just because it's a crucially important point. And I had a lot of times driving here to think about it, so I will subject you to it. Uh, this argument about fighting limited nuclear wars, and I think you see it in the nuclear posture review, is about achieving escalation dominance through technology. That is, I want to put the adversary in a position where he has no other options, and he has got to cry uncle. This is limited nuclear war is a competition in risk taking. Who is willing to run more risk? This is a crucial difference, right? Because if you think the stakes favor you, then you're going to be willing to run more risk. And the question is, risk of what? It's risk of uncontrollable escalation. It's risk of uncontrollable escalation. Who is going to run more risk? And Russian strategy, I think, is based on this understanding of a competition and risk taking. Their near abroad is more important to them than it is to us, especially if they're defending ethnic Russian minorities in places like the Baltic. And you can see improvements in their conventional and nuclear forces that support this defensive strategy, right? First, improve survivability, right? We all remember the 2005. Libra and press piece about how if we, on the right day, in the right moment, we could first strike Russia and take out all their nuclear forces. I, I remember that because I was an action officer in OSD. And do you know these two guys? No, I don't, I've never met them. <laughs> Russians, the Russians listened. They improved the survivability of their nuclear force. They also retained and developed Tactical nuclear weapons. You're, what did we do with our tactical nuclear weapons after the end of the Cold War? Well, Poppy Bush got rid of a lot of them, right? We're, we're kind of out of that mission. And, and that's important to understand when you're reading the NPR, too. Because the NPR is basically saying, you have lots of conventional options. You, the United States, have lots of conventional options. And you're really good at the strategic nuclear stuff. But what's in the middle of the ladder? <laughs> and hurry up and develop a low yield. <laughs> SLBM, Max Schnell, right? That's because we've abandoned that middle of the ladder and the Russians have not. So they've improved their survivability, built tactical nuclear weapons, or maintained and then improved their tactical nuclear weapons, probably violated the INF Treaty while you're at it, and then developed conventional weapons to comp complement that. And some of those conventional weapons right, include, include land attack cruise missiles and an air defense network that can keep the US Air Force out. I think one of the great puzzles for me when I teach a, my US military power class in the fall is, why did Saddam never attack us in a, in a very ambitious way as we were building up our forces in theater? Right? I mean, twice. We, we flowed forces to the region, you know, we practiced, we got ready, and then we invaded. But one of the great lessons is don't allow us to do that, right? Make it hard for us to operate in theater. And Russia has developed a bunch of capabilities, like the Chinese, to prevent us from act, acting in the theater, right? Uh, they also have a number of conventional land attack cruise missiles that are also dual use, which complicates our planning. It's a happy story, right? Uh, they, they contemplate using against NATO allies who are a little bit wobbly, right? So you can imagine, uh, posit the RAND scenario for the Baltics. Russia invades maybe not the entire country of Estonia, but a part of Estonia that has their ethnic brethren. Well, so the United States wants to then, it's obligated to rerun the Gulf War in Estonia. That's the ideal case for us, right? We go in, we build up. 
We eject, but we don't cross into the Russian homeland. That's the model. Well, the Russians understand that that's the model, right? And so now they have a bunch of options across the ladder of escalation, the ladder of violence, that makes it hard for us. You're, going to be, you're at least going to be deterred by the prospect of conventional punishment. This is something that we don't really contemplate because we grew up with, you know, step one, rip down their air defense. Step two, bring freedom. Well, you're going to have to bash down this air defense, probably endure cru conventional cruise missile attacks against your allies. Then you're going to have to think about faring those forces, well, not the people, but the equipment from CONUS, because remember, we, during my time in the Pentagon, we started bringing things back to CONUS. Well, you have to start to ferry them back to Europe. And the Russians have continued to develop capabilities like the backfire bomber that would make that complicated. So let's assume, oh, and the scenario requires to eject Russia, just based on that RAND analysis. I'm slightly biased. Uh, 20 plus brigades, lots of air power, right? You're, you're not fighting Saddam Hussein. You're fighting, you're not fighting the Soviet U Union either. I don't, I'm not here to threaten fleet, only slightly. Uh, this is going to be a formidable fight. And it's, according to this random analysis, it's going to take 40 to 90 days, right? And, and their analysis is we win by a squeaker. Right? But let's think about what that means. You have to bash down that air defense network. It's going to require numerous sorties. There are going to be casualties. Right? And then think about what, your, uh, what, what is your consolation prize when you win this conventional fight to liberate Estonia? Well, the potential of Russia using nuclear weapons. And what would that look like, right? You, you start to win. The Russian strategy is, well, look, the United States, NATO, I have a survivable nuclear force. Yeah, maybe it's not the Soviet force of the 1970s, but it's, it's survivable enough that I could hit the US homeland. And what would nuclear use look like? Well, how about alerting during a crisis? How about brandishing those weapons? Remember, when Putin took Crimea, he made statements about how Russian nuclear forces were at the ready. I don't know if that's bluff or not, but it has deterrent value. But about demonstration attacks? Oh, this might be a good time to test, because I know the United States and CNN are watching. Then you could always use tactical nuclear. If you're losing the conventional fight, you could always use tactical nuclear weapons to reverse the conventional balance. And then what do you do as the United States? Because this conventional fight is very difficult, because you're projecting power into the teeth of the bear. So let's think about Russia's nuclear calculation. What would drive Russia to use nuclear weapons? Well, the first question we've already talked about is the conventional balance. But what about this risk, right? Russian decision makers have to know that using nuclear weapons is dangerous. And I can point to numerous statements by Mattis or other US policymakers, uh, Depth Secretary, Secretary of Defense Robert Work, reminding Russia that if you use nuclear weapons, uncontrollable things, this is a dangerous thing, no one's going to win. All right. But if I'm in a competition of risk taking, don't I want to run those risks if the stakes are high for me? And I think this is, this is an important point. We have to decide how you get good outcomes in these limited nuclear wars. Uh, 13 years ago, when I worked on these issues in the building, people talked about off-ramps. Oh, we will, we will find off-ramps. People are still talking about off-ramps. And you ask, well, what does the off-ramp look like? Right? My, my favorite off-ramp is don't get involved at all. But, right, but that makes me sound like the second coming of Neville Chamberlain. But I have trouble thinking about what the other off-ramps look like. Right? And I keep going back to how this is a really difficult situation. And then when NATO is in this situation, we definitely were going to use nuclear weapons first in the way I just described. And we did it because we understood that there were risks, but the stakes were really high for us. 
There's an alternative view that I think is quite popular in government, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to it, but I don't think it's compelling. And that is we can find a technological solution to these limited nuclear wars. That is we'll build some really good missile defense, we'll have good nuclear and conventional counterforce. The adversary will know this, they won't run these kinds of risks. But remember, that depends on your ability to control the war. And I'm not sure once these wars happen, you'll be able to control them. And clever adversaries who have more at stake will manipulate that and use that to their advantage. I said there was a defensive point to this strategy. I think there's an offensive point to this strategy. Russia reminds me a lot of Pakistan. What do I mean by that? Well, it's not because it's domestically unstable and exporting Islamic extremism. No, that's not what I mean. I mean it's because they have nuclear weapons and think about using nuclear weapons as a shield against a superior conventional adversary. So my colleague Paul Kapoor at the Naval Postgraduate School has written a terrific book about Pakistan's nuclear strategy and he makes the argument that since they developed nuclear weapons, their support for low, what we used to call low intensity conflict and it became irregular warfare and now it became hybrid warfare, their support for low intensity conflict has gone up in South Asia. I think Russia's kind of adhering to that playbook, right? I don't think it's particularly special. I don't think it deserves a, a new name. This is just international politics. Uh, if you ask, well, what does Russia really want? I'm not sure they want to march to Berlin again, because then they would lose a paying customer for all their gas. Uh, but I do think that Russia is upset about the status quo drawn in 1991. Uh, and I don't want to sound like uh, I'm carrying the brief for, for Russia, but uh, Vladimir is nodding. Uh, but we told them we would not uh, unify Germany, and we did. And then we told them we wouldn't put a unified Germany in NATO, and we did. We told them we wouldn't expand NATO, we did. We told them we would adhere to the ABM Treaty, and we got rid of it. And then the EU plays kissy face with Ukraine. and I mean, at some point, Right, great powers strike back. This may be shocking for those of you who thought that great power war and great power conflict ended and you still got your Tom Friedman on your shelf somewhere and globalization will solve all these problems, but I think this makes perfect sense for Russia that at the level of low levels of violence, using low intensity conflict to try to change the status quo, to try to divide NATO. That's been a Russian goal since the advent of NATO, right? If we were to go back in time 30 years ago, we'd be having a conversation about German neutralization. Well, is Germany going to go neutral at some point? And, and did you see in Sunday's newspaper, the article in a German newspaper uh, about advocating maybe Germany should start thinking about acquiring nuclear weapons? That's, that's a sea change, right? So. Implications of all this. Russia's got this strategy, it's like layers of an onion at the core of the onion, is develop survival nuclear forces. So Lieber and Press are wrong. The second rung of that, uh, that onion, second part of that onion, is develop limited nuclear options. So if you get in a conventional fight, you can avoid losing. Third layer of that onion, and this allows you to use low intensity conflict in the near abroad. And it deters US intervention. And then you wrap that onion in developments in Russian conventional precision guided munitions. This is a pretty impressive rational strategy. What does this mean? Well, the first point I want to leave with you is that uh, I want to remind you that extended deterrence is really dangerous. If I told you that in 1983, you'd understand. We'd all go home and watch the day after and have a stiff drink. <laughs> but most of my students don't understand that, right? They're, they're worried about 9-11. But we're now back into a world, just read the nuclear posture review, we're contemplating the use of nuclear weapons in a limited way, right? Why are we doing that? Well, because I've gone from threatening first use to deterring first use. I, I can't think of a more difficult mission. I, I need the technology, go out and build me the technological capabilities so when I have the Russian down at the bear on the mat and I'm gonna give him the coup de grace, that he'll disarm, he'll give up. 
Because my reading of Cold War history is that when we were down on the mat, we were not going to give up. We were going to use nuclear weapons. How do I deter that? How do you deter someone who is in the domain of losses? How do you deter someone who is about to get the coup de grace from using nuclear weapons? I don't know. Right? That, you, you all figured that out. I'm sure it has something to do with hypersonics. <laughs> <laughs> or ninjas. And then we have to think about escalation management. I, I laid out two opposing views of limited nuclear war. One, it's highly technological. This is the Harold Brown denial school. And one that's about a competition in stakes. And then the way I described it, at least as a baseline, is it's very rational. And at some point, someone gives up. But there's going to be all these different pressures for escalation. As a crisis erupts before the war begins, there'll be temptations to strike first, right? If I can limit damage by striking first against some kind of opponent, they'll know this, and I'll know this, and they'll know this. You see, this is what Schelling called the reciprocal fear of surprise attack. So just in the crisis, before the shooting starts, that instability is there. As the shooting starts, there's going to be the temptation to preempt, because the longer a war goes on, the more survivable well, in some respects, more survivable the adversary's forces. And here I have in particular in mind, if I want to go after, with the real boogeyman for us are Russian mobile missiles, SS-25, SS-27. If, if they disperse, right, that's a harder target set to go after. So I might want to go after them early. And then there's just plain accidents. And then there's inadvertence, right? Dear Russia, well, this is only a conventional war. Please refer to the Marquis de Queensberry rules on page four. This is a conventional only fight until it's not. And again, I think that the real issue here is competitions and risk taking as opposed to some kind of technological solution to nuclear use. And then lastly, what's the right, what's the right US nuclear strategy? And I guess I should have put, what's the right US conventional and nuclear strategy? We're in a bad spot. I read the Nuclear Posture Review, and I don't think, oh my god, who, who, who's thinking about limited nuclear war? We've never thought about it. This is so awful, right? It's not true. Everyone thinks about limited nuclear war. I mean, not everyone. My wife doesn't think about it. But <laughs> the, the current Nuclear Posture Review deserves credit for grappling with a really tough situation. Which is, how do you deter someone from using nuclear weapons first? And uh, if you ever read, uh, sometimes, I, I don't always read it, but uh, The War on the Rocks had this great piece by Frank Miller about the low yield SLBM, right? And, and he basically says that it's the whole leadership targets at risk. I'm not, I'm not sure I want to hold leadership targets at risk, right? And maybe you do, right? If, if, if you have a Schelling-esque risk point of view, right, then you're engaging in the competition of risk taking with Russia by saying, OK, I understand all the developments you've made, but now I have this capability that can penetrate your air defense. You can run, but you can't hide. And it's going to be low yield, right? And you're basically generating more risk. So th that makes sense. But I'm not sure that was the logic behind the thinking. If the logic is the other way, which is I'm looking for technological solutions to fight limited nuclear war, then you need to control escalation, which means you probably don't want to target leaders because <laughs> someone has to turn it off. So if anything, this is a cry for let's be clear about our logics, about why we're doing what we're doing. All right, I've babbled long enough. Questions? Questions? 